Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Type 2 panel Q&A session. I'm so excited to see so many people from across the globe here um, joining us today. I think, you know, this is a really unique opportunity for you to get some of your questions answered with really world-renowned endocrinologists who are all experts in diabetes. I want to go ahead and have our panel um, you can go ahead and show your camera and unmute yourself. And maybe I'll just um, start by having our panel introduce themselves. And then for everyone um, who's joining us today, if you would please write any questions that you have in the Q&A box. We're not gonna be able to get to all of them today, but we'll try and make sure that we cover as many kind of general questions as possible. Um, so Dr. Chu, can you start and introduce yourself, please? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Nalima Chu. I'm an endocrinologist here in San Diego, work for Sharp Reese Daily, and happy to be here and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Dr. Buse, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, Tricia. Uh, my name is John Buse. I'm a diabetologist at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I have been a friend and colleague of Dr. Edelman's for uh, over 30 years. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Bader, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Dr. Santos. Um, I'm also an endocrinologist. I'm, I work at UC San Diego, had the, um, the honor of training with um, Dr. Santos and, and Steve Edelman and Jeremy Pettis. Um, and now I'm a part of TCOID. I'm just really excited to be here, part of this panel, and I'm looking forward to learning from all these great diabetes experts as well. Okay, so we already have some great questions coming into the chat box. Um, you know, one of the questions I see here is about hemoglobin A1C and feeling like it's just frozen in time. And I know many of my patients are frustrated with this. They feel like their A1C just can't budge. What do you tell your patients or kind of what is your approach when, when this is the case? And um, you know, how much do you rely on A1C to help you and how much should we really hang our hat on that? That's a complicated question. I will take a <laughs> swing at it maybe. So, so there's kind of two questions. One is, you know, what is the A1C? What do we do with that number and how much do we rely on it? And then the second question is, you know, if you're stuck on, on your blood sugar control and you're just not getting at your targets that you want to be, and so the A1C is obviously a number that we all talk about a lot. We've used it for a long time and it's kind of been the, the, the backbone of our, you know, our, our judging how well um, we as providers are doing in, in managing diabetes and helping you know, patients reach their glycemic targets. I'll say for sure A1C is not the be all end all. And you know, now we have um, you know, time and range that comes off of continuous glucose monitors. We have other ways of measuring blood glucose averages. Um, so it's, it, you know, the A1C is not, you know, the ultimate target, but it is important and we rely on it a lot. A lot of the medications and evidence and, and all that we've sort of done research in many, many decades, a lot of it's been based on the A1C. So it does matter. And we do want to continue to work on getting people's A1C towards their target, which has to be individualized for each patient. So the first question I would ask is, you know, if you know what your A1C is, um, do you know what your A1C target is? Because that's going to be different for every individual person. So that's one question I think that not every provider has with, with every patient, um, figuring out what their individual A1C target is, because um, it may not be the same. It may not be the standard cutoff of less than seven. In many cases, it is. Um, so that's the first place I would start. You know, what do you really want your, want your A1C to be? Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that statement. Um, A1C is also an average. So a good A1C doesn't necessarily mean that things are always going well. It could mean you're having a lot of low blood sugars that are very concerning. Um, you know, I really worry about low blood sugars because they can cause harm today. We uh, use A1C as a marker to prevent long-term complications because studies have shown that at, you know, above seven, they increase in long-term complications. But you may have an A1C of 6.5 and you think you're doing great, but if you're having blood sugars in the 40s and 50s, and on the other spectrum, you're having glucose levels of 300s, you're going to average out to a beautiful A1C. 
but those 30s are going to be more stressful for me than a 300 um, that you may be having. So uh, I absolutely agree um, that you know it's an individual approach is what's important here and to look at the numbers. And if the A1C is not budging and you're always checking in the morning, my, my thing with my patients is, you know, how about we check some in the evening or check another time? I often find that people get into a routine and they may be coming in with their fasting blood sugars of 110, 120, and they're looking great. And you would expect an A1C to be 6.5 with that. But if you're coming in at eight, that's a sign to me that maybe somewhere else in the day, you're having much higher numbers. And we really need to target those. We need to find those. So maybe we need to switch around your routine as to when you're checking them so we can find out how we can help you and move that A1C. Just to add one other wrinkle, uh, I, I do think the most important thing is to communicate your frustration with your um, new doctor and uh, point out to him that you're willing to try new things uh, if you are. Uh, I don't know whether you have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, but there's a lot of powerful technology out there um, that's new, uh, particularly in type 2 diabetes. Um, you know, there are GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are remarkably powerful diabetes drugs uh, for uh, glucose lowering that are not associated with low blood sugar as a complication. Um, the use of CGM technology, um, as Schaefer pointed out, might really help. And the last thing is if you're really stuck um, and you're uh, overweight, substantially overweight, bariatric surgery is really an option. I think one other thing to recognize is if you're stuck close to your goal, um, recognize that being close to your goal is much, 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 much better than being far from your goal. So if your A1C is 7.3, keep up the fight. You're doing great. Maybe you haven't gotten to the 6.9 that you want to have, uh, but you'd still get an A plus in my book. Absolutely. I, I think those are all wonderful points. And, you know, even, you know, you should be celebrating if your A1C is dropping from 12 to 11 or nine to eight, you know, every little budge that we make is great. So it's easy to get frustrated. Um, but, you know, understanding these sorts of things that all of you are talking about, I think is really important. Dr. Buse, you mentioned, you know, all of the new technologies and medications that are available. I did see a question in here on um, Medicare coverage for CGM, but you know, for our panel here, how do you feel about CGM in type two diabetes, and you know, should patients be looking into this? For me, it depends on the the whole story. So, if you're only on oral agents and your A1C is where you want to be, um, and blood pressure is good, everything is good, there may not be a reason to complicate your life, you know, with a, um, with a device that frankly can have alarms and, um, you know, it depends on the, on the full picture. I do think if you're very poorly controlled, um, there may be advantages of knowing where the problem is by using CGM. Um, and many patients um, experience um, when they know that their blood sugar is high, they actually redouble their efforts with regards to their lifestyle uh, management. They may be care more careful about snacking and that sort of thing. So just being more aware through the day where your blood sugar is can sometimes really help. Um, you know, it's, it's one of many options. I don't think it's right for or necessary for everyone. And then the last thing is uh, for all patients on virtually every insurance plan, the so-called diagnostic CGM, where we look at a tracing over uh, a week or two, um, can provide a lot of information um, that we can provide to you uh, to give you feedback. Um, so you don't get the results in real time, um, but then you have a report where you can look over uh, what happens during the day, day after day in your care. Great. Um, Another question that I saw here that I think applies to a lot of patients is how do you how should a patient prepare for their visit with their doctor um, or their diabetes provider? And this particular question, it looks like the patient is not seeing an endocrinologist, which is 
you know, the case for most people with type two diabetes who are not seeing, you know, a diabetes specialist necessarily, how, what would you all recommend for patients that they should do or bring to their appointment? It's really important for me or any of the primary doctors. Um, I do work at a place, not every patient who has diabetes sees an endocrinologist and that is okay. And um, if you're well controlled and you're not having any complications or issues, a primary physician that's well trained in family medicine or internal medicine is perfectly capable of taking care of diabetes. But for any visit, whether it's to us or to them, it's important to bring your meter um, so they can download it in the office. If they don't have a downloading ca uh, capability to write down your blood sugars, but bring in your meter, uh, have your questions prepared. If you're having side effects, you want to be able to discuss those with them. If you're having low blood sugars or high, um, the timing of those, uh, that's important. Um, so coming in with those questions, ready to ask any comments or concerns that you're having, and also uh, objective information like your glucose levels um, so that they can see and evaluate them would be very, very helpful. And of course, if labs are due before the appointment, if you can get those done, that helps tie everything in together. I think, you know, for patients, sometimes patients feel like, um, they don't want to get their labs done or they don't want to bring their meter in because then us as providers, we're going to see those, you know, horrible numbers that are on their meter. Um, but would you say that you'd rather see those high numbers and be able to do something about it rather than, you know, have no data at all? Absolutely. Um, you know, it's better to know so we can do something about it. Like you mentioned, uh, even A1C going from 12 to 11 is a big thing for us. We are happy with that. Um, we want to see movement forward. Um, and without knowing it, it still ends up being a social visit and we can talk and it's always lovely to see you in the office or even on Zoom, but we are here to help you. And the only way we can do that is if we can be real and, and really talk about how we can uh, improve your numbers. Um, and of course, that's not the end all be all. We do wanna hear about everything else that's going on because diabetes is one of those things, stresses are gonna affect your blood sugars. So we do wanna be um, realistic about what's happening just right now. I know everybody is stressed and a lot of things are going on. Um, that's all part of, uh, I feel like, what we need to take care of. Yeah, uh, just to take it a little bit further, I, I think, I mean, the one thing I really uh, impress on patients is nothing that they could tell me uh, would shock me or would be something that I haven't heard. I take medications for medical problems that I have. I forget from time to time. Um, the most important thing is to communicate honestly and openly with your doctor. Do not worry that they're going to be upset with you or disappointed in you or anything. You know, walking a day in anybody else's shoes is a very tough road. And we all recognize that it's, it's hard to take care of diabetes 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of your life. Um, and we're there to just to figure out how to help you do the best with whatever um, energy and focus you can bring to managing your diabetes. But we have to know what you're doing to be able to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I can't, I could not agree with you both more that, um, you know, without, without honesty between a provider and a patient, you know, it's really hard to move forward. Um, Dr. Chu, you brought up a point um, just a second ago with a lack of more questions in the chat box. I'll just say, I think a lot of people out there are um, hearing a lot of news about um, diabetes and COVID. And I know Dr. Bader, you just recently published a paper on this as well. Um, you know, what, what are you telling your patients about how to stay safe or what their risks are having type two diabetes and COVID? Um, I think a lot of people out there right now want to know. 
believe me, this has been a very hot topic. Um, this comes up all the time. And I'll take it even a step further is, am I recommending them to, if they are essential workers or if they're in a job like the school teachers, am I recommending them not to work or stay home? Um, this has been a hot topic since March. And one, I know it's scary. It's scary to hear that, you know, if you have diabetes, you're at high risk. But what I try to tell them is like, what is it about diabetes that puts someone at high risk? It's the heart disease. Uh, it could be the kidney issues. It's poorly controlled diabetes that puts someone at high risk. You have to take the same precautions that I have to take or someone without diabetes has to take. Wearing a mask, avoiding um, crowds, social distancing, all of that is very important. It's not necessarily the medication that you're taking, although that has come up too, ACE inhibitors. Um, that was a big thing, which is taken for blood pressure. ACE inhibitors are medications like lisinopril, monopril, zestril, um, that have been shown that, that may worsen uh, COVID and cause issues. But um, honestly, I think what it is, is taking care of your blood sugars, following the safety precautions. Um, and if you're having any symptoms to be able to talk to your doctors um, is what we are recommending. I think that's very well said. And that, you know, ultimately all these things that we're, that we talk about you know, at these TCID conferences, and hopefully that your, your, you know, your endocrinologist and your primary care doctor are talking about, these are the things that are the exact same things we need to be thinking about during COVID, plus, you know, of course, the extra protection of, of doing everything you can to not contract the virus in the first place. But it's, 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 you know, working on your weight, working on your blood pressure control, protecting your heart, and, you know, doing the best that you can and controlling your blood sugars. Um, unfortunately, and when people do get COVID and they have diabetes, you know, across the population level, the outcomes tend to be worse. That's not true for everybody, of course. People with diabetes get COVID and recover fine. But, you know, it, that, is, that is true on a population scale. So we want to basically keep you as healthy as possible. And um, it may be worth taking that extra, um, you know, precaution to protect yourself, you know, limit your exposure to other people, do all these things that, you know, the... Um, the infectious disease folks and the public health folks are recommending wearing masks, of course, limiting, you know, um, you know your gatherings, um, especially right now when we finally, you know, have some effective vaccines on the way. Now is not the time to let our, our guard down. Um, on the contrary, there's, you know, cases are rising everywhere. So it's kind of a, this weird, scary time where there's light at the end of the tunnel, but there's a lot of people who are sick and this virus is still going around. So keep your guard up, um, you know, be careful over these holidays. And it just, this is going to be a, a weird ending to a weird year, but, um, you know, the best thing to do is this, you know, keep, keep your head down and, and, and stay safe during this next few months. Um, I, I do think that, you know, uh, speaking of the vaccine, um, it will be important. I'll certainly be getting the vaccine the first opportunity I get. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I trust the science, I trust the medicine, um, and, everything in these vaccines have been very carefully reviewed and I plan to look over the, the, the evidence as well myself, but my plan is to get the vaccine. And after I get the vaccine, I'll certainly encourage my patients to get the vaccine as well, if it's appropriate for them, um, which it will be in the vast majority of people who have diabetes. So it's going to be important to get your flu vaccine once available, get the COVID vaccine, do everything you can to protect yourself from these infections. I might add one other thing. If you're having a symptom that's worrisome to you and in normal times you would go to see your doctor or to the emergency room, do not hesitate to do that. Um, I think there are probably more people who are getting into trouble delaying care for, you know, they're having problems with chest pains or, you know, they're having swelling of their legs and they just don't want to get checked out and expose themselves to a hospital full of patients with COVID. Um, the hospital is an incredibly safe place. Getting there is more dangerous than being there. Um, and so it's just absolutely essential if you have a problem that you seek medical attention. If you do get COVID, um, again, you might think from what you've read that you're a goner, uh, but the vast majority of people who get COVID with diabetes are gonna survive. Um, so seek medical attention if you think you need it. The, the last thing I'll say is I'm aware of several studies that, um, that suggest that the medications that we prescribe you for your diabetes actually reduce your risk of, of having poor outcomes in COVID. And in particular, 
Metformin uh, is of great interest. We're trying to get a big trial for metformin for COVID done. Um, the SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists may have specific benefits. Statins may have specific benefits. So take the medications that you're prescribed. Um, they, they almost certainly will reduce your risk of a poor outcome should you get COVID. And me too, I will get the vaccine the first day I can. Uh, I have reviewed the data. It's available to everybody online now, um, the full reports from the FDA and the manufacturers. So it looks really good. I, I think that's a really good point Dr. Buse brought up that, you know, this, you know, all we hear about is COVID. It is scary. We need to protect ourselves. But it, the, the WHO, the, the World Health Organization, came out with their annual report of, of sort of um, worldwide causes of death. And um, this year has not been completed, so this was sort of looking at the at last year. But even if we add up all the COVID deaths around the world this year, it's barely breaking into the top 10 causes of death around the world. Cardiovascular disease is still number one. So, so you know, how, forever terrible this, this pandemic really is, uh, don't, you know, don't give up taking care of your other health issues or skip out if you're having problems. Yeah, and I think that the point that the hospitals are safe is so important. And we know, you know, all of us here work in the hospital and we all know that our hospitals are not risky for us to be there every single day. Um, you know, healthcare workers are not getting COVID from being around these COVID patients all the time. So the hospital, I tell my friends, the hospital is one of the safest, it's safer than going to the grocery store as far as I'm concerned. But um, so don't delay your medical care because you, you're both are right. You're absolutely more likely to have some sort of complication related to your other medical problems than, um, you know, COVID at this point, not to minimize it. But, um, you know, Dr. Buse, you brought up several medications. Um, and I think in the type two world right now, you know, I do hear a lot of patients getting concerned about metformin, despite the fact that we all think it's, it's one of the best medications for type two diabetes. Um, as well as you brought up a couple of, you know, the newest medications that we have, which are not even so new anymore, the GLP ones and SGLT twos. Do any of you have comments on, you know, how you talk to patients about these medications. I know oftentimes it's scary these days because patients kind of, you, you, all of us can read a lot online and get scared about the side effects and how should we balance kind of our fear about medication with the benefits? Because as you mentioned, there may be some benefit in COVID. There's certainly benefits beyond diabetes for these medications, many of them. So metformin is being studied now to prevent cancer, to prevent disability in the setting of just aging um, related to dementia and um, other you know, cardiovascular disease. Um, I have thought, though I don't have diabetes, I have thought about asking my primary care doctor to prescribe me metformin. Um, I, I do think it has very little chance of hurting anybody. And many people are interested in the potential that metformin has to help just about everybody, uh, at least people who are older or overweight. And these SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists, if I had diabetes, I would take them. And frankly, based on the benefits on heart disease and kidney disease that have been demonstrated, similarly, I have thought about asking my primary care doctor, even though I don't have diabetes, uh, about whether I should take those medications uh, because of their effects on blood pressure and weight um, and cardiovascular and kidney disease. Right. And there's even data out now showing benefit in, for at least SGLT2s, I know, in non-diabetics. So it's really, I think you're right. I think people are going to be chomping at the bit to get to some of these medications. Sorry, Dr. Chu, were you going to say something? I was. I'm reading some of the chats and there's um, people have been saying that they have complications or side effects from these medications. And what I would like to point out is, um, you know, it's not all or none. Uh, if you're having diarrhea that's really bad on metformin 2000 milligrams, maybe 1000 you'll tolerate it. So it, it's not about a yes, I can tolerate it or no, I cannot. Um, there is inter we can go in between, which will give you just as many benefits. And yes, we've all seen um, that many metformin uh, company 
companies that are making metformin, especially the extended release, has pulled some of their medications off the market. But what is available is safe. So in terms of cancer risk, um, I definitely understand the concerns that people have. But if you were on one of those formulations, we can always switch it to something else. So don't be uh, alarmed about some of the stuff that's out there. The ones that um, can increase the risk for cancer, with, um, they have been pulled off the market. So if you're getting the medication from your pharmacy, it is safe and don't feel like you need to stop the medicine. And if you're having side effects with 2000, talk to your doctor. Maybe you'll do fine with 1000 and still have benefits. And that goes with all the other medications as well. Yeah, right. So all of these classes, we can use lower doses of GLP-1 medications and still get some of the benefit or the SGLT2s. Um, Dr. Bader, do you want to comment on this? This is kind of a follow-up. What is better, insulin or the other medications that we're talking about right now? That's a good question. Uh, you know, we when we think about what medication is best, there's, there's no right answer. This has to be individualized. And I know we keep saying that, um, but, it's, but it's so true. What's best for me is not best for Dr. Chu and it's not best for you. Uh, it's gonna be a little bit different for everybody. And you know, more and more, we as endocrinologists or diabetologists are thinking about you know, what are the benefits of these medications in addition to their glycemic control, which is why we keep bringing up these classes like the GLP-1s and the SGLT-2s and why Dr. Buse is going to start taking them even though he doesn't have diabetes because they can protect the heart, they can protect the kidneys, they can help you lose weight. Um, so there are some major benefits to some of these newer classes of medications that you may not get from something like insulin. That being said, we use insulin all the, all the time. It's a fantastic medication. Um, being on insulin is not necessarily the, the wrong thing to do. Insulin actually works well with many of the other medications. So sometimes it's a combination of, for example, metformin plus insulin or a GLP-1 plus insulin once a day. Um, and, and so any of these combinations are viable, but it is important just to make sure that you and your provider are, are thinking about these different medications and, and, and you're, if you're asking them, is this the right group of medicines for me? So the nice thing about insulin that is different than any other, other medication that we have available is that we can find the right dose for you as a, an individual. Insulin, we can adjust the dose essentially indefinitely to find that dose that's right for you. We can't do that with, with most other medications. We're kind of limited with a, with a couple of doses. Um, so insulin is unique. It's a great tool. Um, it's not necessarily right or wrong, but, but it's definitely something to consider. Yeah, insulin has um, gotten a lot of bad rep, uh, I'll tell you. Um, been doing this long enough to hear all kinds of stories, uh, threats that, you know, kind of insulin gets used as, oh, if your A1C is not better, I'm going to start you on insulin, like a punishment. Um, and, you know, and maybe that was okay 30 years ago when there were syringes and not many kinds of insulins that were available. Now with the ease of pens, and there are so many different insulins available that fit fit for you, insulin is, should not be a threat. It should not be the last case scenario. It shouldn't be the ultimate, um, you know, uh, punishment. Uh, I see that, I see insulin as an adjuvant therapy to everything else that you may be on to get you to where you need to go. Um, and the dose doesn't matter. That's another thing I hear. I hear stories like, oh, I'm taking 50, but my friend is only taking 12 or 10. Am I much worse than they are? And that is not true. It's about what your body needs uh, to get you to where you need to go. And everybody is different. So you can't base it on what somebody else is doing. And just to add, if you have type 1 diabetes, insulin is life-saving medication. Do not, under any circumstance, stop it. Um, um, it's absolutely essential. And all the other therapies that we talk about in type 1 diabetes, you know, at best can have a small benefit compared to the need for insulin. Right. There are, you know, on the topic of insulin, there are a few questions in the um, Q&A about insulin pumps. Um, type twos who are on insulin pumps. Um, some of the questions are comments saying how much better their blood sugars were when they were on a clinical trial on a pump. And others are saying I'm on a pump and my blood sugar, and I'm on a GLP one with that pump and my blood sugars are still high. Um, and, and it's hard to answer those questions in terms of what to do now, because it's, 
we keep saying this, but it's very individualized and it depends on everything going on. Um, any, any thoughts on pumps for type two diabetics? Do they, do you need to go on a pump to have great control? Um, thoughts on this? Personally, I have very, 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 very few patients with type 2 diabetes on insulin pumps. The ones that I do have type 2 diabetes technically, but they really aren't making very much insulin. I think in that setting, that's where the pump, you know, allows for just much more um, precise dosing um, in the setting of type 1 diabetes for sure, and in those really very low insulin producing patients with type two diabetes that functionally really have more like type one diabetes. I think in type two diabetes, you know, the most magical therapies as far as helping large numbers of patients get to good blood sugar control without hypoglycemia are the GLP-1 receptor agonists. I mean, they are arguably more powerful than insulin or at least as powerful. Um, but there are some patients with type 2 diabetes that do need pumps. Um, and then if you're going to have the, the sort of fuss and bother of using an insulin pump, uh, I would work very closely with a diabetes educator and an endocrinologist to make sure you're making optimal use of that technology. Otherwise, it's just providing you a more burden than taking one shot a day for sure. Um, and, um, you know, you should just make sure you're getting the most out of your pump. Yeah, good points. Um, there was one question in here I just don't want to leave hanging. Um, Dr. Chu, you had mentioned ACE inhibitors, which were during COVID. Um, and, you know, there was some data with concern about ACE, taking ACE inhibitors. Um, you know, would that put you at increased risk of getting COVID? And ACE inhibitors and um, ARB medications, some people may be on, these are blood pressure medications um, for patients with diabetes. Can you clarify, Dr. Chu, whether or not these, we still think these medications are risky for our patients? Should they continue to take, you know, their lisinopril, their losartan, these sorts of medications, um, or should they switch to another medication? These medications are, we use these medications in diabetes for a number of reasons. It's not just blood pressure control. It also helps protect your kidneys from worsening um, protein in the urine, and it is very beneficial. With any medications, I would not recommend stopping anything. I think it's important to talk to your physicians. I have not stopped these medicines in any of my patients. Um, you know, there, there are many reasons why we use these medications, and we don't want your blood pressure to get out of control. We don't want further kidney damage. All of those can also worsen complications of COVID. So it's, uh, again, it's important to have that dialogue with your doctor. I think you need to, if you have any concerns, you need to bring that up. Um, but I would not recommend stopping any of the medicines that you're on because you're worried about COVID. When studies come out, you know, they come out showing everything. Like if you read a package insert for Tylenol, it's going to say liver failure, but that does not mean you don't take Tylenol when you get a headache. So there are risks and benefits for everything. And I would not recommend stopping any of the medicines right now. Thank you. There's another question, which we haven't touched too much on here about hypoglycemia and what are the risks of hypoglycemia with insulin? Um, does somebody want to comment on hypoglycemia and kind of why that may make us choose one medication or another if we have options? I like talking about hypoglycemia. We don't talk about it enough. And, and I think that's probably true across the board. And um, especially in type 2 diabetes, sometimes we, we, don't, we just don't think about it. Um, certainly, you know, for many years, we had medications like the sulfonylureas, things like uh, glimepiride, glipizide. These are oral medications, pills that can cause hypoglycemia. Um, insulin certainly has you know, the chance of causing low blood sugar hypoglycemia. And, and as Dr. Chu mentioned earlier, you know, hypoglycemia is bad. So having low blood sugars can be extremely dangerous. Um, and sometimes we're so focused um, you know, on a broader scale, we are focused on lowering blood sugars, getting that A1C down that we neglect to talk about hypoglycemia and consider the risk of it. So we really wanna avoid low blood sugars, hypoglycemia at all costs. And um, the good thing again about these neuroclasses of medications is that they do not tend to cause hypoglycemia. There's an extremely low risk of them causing low blood sugars. 
Um, if you take a sulfonylurea or if you take insulin and you add other medications to it, you can still get low blood sugars from the, the glipizide or the insulin. But um, the GLP-1s, the SGLT-2 inhibitors, metformin, they don't cause low blood sugars. And so, you know, we, again, we have more tools available now and, and um, we can really start to move away from some of these agents that do cause lows. But if you're someone who has hypoglycemia in the past or has it now, that's a really good reason to talk to your doctor about switching up your, your medications. And, and then one other thing to add to that is, you know, Dr. Buse mentioned um, wearing, if you, we talked a little bit about CGM. He talked about using one of these sort of um, short-term professional CGMs where you just wear it for a couple of weeks and you get a bunch of information and you go back and review it with your doctor. Um, that's actually a really good way to, to look for hypoglycemia. People that are on insulin or sulfonylurea sometimes have low blood sugars and don't even know it. It can happen in the middle of the night and you don't even wake up from it. And it's kind of causing you problems. It's causing damage that you don't know about. So these medications that, that cause risks for low blood sugars, um, I think there's you know good reason to think about switching off of those medications if you have the opportunity. Absolutely. I think... Um, unfortunately, this time goes by so fast with all these great questions, but we only have two minutes left. So I'd like to maybe just hear from each of you if you can give kind of one pearl or one piece of advice that you would like people to kind of take away um, from the session today. Okay, I, I don't mind going first if you don't. Uh, um, you know, it's always very interesting to me when people come into my office and they say, oh, I saw this on TV or um, my friend is using this and it worked really well. That's great to get all that information, but my priority is you. It's not what we see on TV or, um, or your friend who's doing very well. And when I get to know you, I get to know all your other medical problems. I get to um, know what works for you and what your side effects are and what issues that you may be having. And unfortunately, I hate to bring this up, but another big part of that equation is insurance. We are very limited when we prescribe things based on what's your insurance. I would hate to give you a medication then have you go to the pharmacy and have it be $500 per month because I know that's not gonna be feasible in the long term. So what's important for me is what works for you. And you are the only person that I care about when you're in my office. So it's finding a medication that you can tolerate and you can afford. There are many ways to get diabetes under good control. There isn't one answer here, and we have lots of lots of options. So sometimes we may have to find that right combination. And I think being patient with us as, and being honest with us is extremely helpful to get you to where you need to go. Uh, my quick closing comment would be, you know, TCOID is a, just a source of so much awesome information. Um, so, so first of all, thanks for being here. And um, my, my advice is to, to, you know, you've soaked in a lot of information today. I'm sure you've been to a bunch of different lectures and heard different, different advice on medications and diet and all these different things. Um, you, you soaked in a lot of that, but I also advise you to just take a moment at the end of the day sit down and think about one or two or three specific things that you want to do differently, that you want to change, whether it's a question that you want to take to your doctor, whether it's thinking about a change to your medications, whether it's thinking about how to increase your physical activity, whether it's adjusting your diet, something that you can do and stick with um, to make some real practical change for, your, for yourself, for your own health. So just to kind of consolidate the day down into a couple of actionable items. You know, coming last in this hit parade doesn't leave me a lot of uh, a lot of room to to say something new. I do think that being honest with your doctor is the single most important thing you can do. You will not shock him or her. You will not upset him or her. Or if you do, find another doctor. Um, there are plenty of people that want to listen to what you have to say and work with you to find the best way forward. Um, and when you get a chance to get the COVID vaccine, I would strongly recommend that you do it. Um, I think it's gonna make a huge difference in the health of our nation, um, both physically um, as well as 
economically and emotionally, we need to get past this. And to get past that, this, everybody is going to have to get a vaccine. Yeah, such great points. Um, thank you all so much for your words of wisdom today. I think um, all of us really learned a lot and we really appreciate you being here. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you. for the opportunity. Thank you.